If you think for one second that I was prepared for the Arlong arc, you would be 100% mistaken. Welcome or welcome back. My name is Amber Elise. I am obsessed with talking about books and as of late mangas. If you are as well, then hello, you have found your new YouTube home. Today is a one piece day. If you are new here, I am currently reading the manga and we are going arc by arc and having full on discussions. Last one piece video, we talked about the Barati A arc and this week is all about Arlong and the Logtown arcs. Also, I have to add that these arcs close out the East Blue Saga which is nuts. And now that our housekeeping tasks are complete, we have a lot, a lot to discuss. I cannot start off this discussion without giving a well-deserved apology, an apology to Queen Nami. Nami, I misjudged you. I really thought you were annoying. I thought you were a thief, then you kind of are a thief. But I thought that you were selfish. I thought that you really were just there, maybe a filler character at the least, but oh my goodness, you are amazing. You are a true leader. You are a woman of power. And I was not thinking any of those things of you initially. I was wrong. If you watch my other videos, I did not care for Nami. And I even said in my last video, will there be any redeeming qualities about Nami? Because in Baratier, the last thing we learned about Nami was that she sailed off into the yonder with the treasure leaving our crew by themselves. And I was pretty upset about it. I was just hoping that her character wouldn't be around anymore. I was not expecting what we got. I did not know that she was an orphan. I didn't know that she lost someone so important to her. I didn't know that she sacrificed everything to gain enough money or berries, should I say, to be able to free her town. I did not know that she went through so much. And not only how much she went through, but how much she suppressed inside and kept such a strong, steady mindset to accomplish her goal. And I have more to say about Nami later, but I had to start this discussion with an apology because I was so wrong. I was so wrong. It's almost ridiculous. It's almost funny, but here we are, lesson learned. With that said, I have to get into our main villain of this arc, Sawtooth Arlong. This man actually scared me. Or should I say this fish man actually scared me. I think the best word to describe Sawtooth Arlong is wicked or maybe wicked's a bit too much. I think brutal, brutal would be a better word. He was a brutal character. He had the kind of apathy that Captain Kuro had, but with way more strength. And I feel like he was the first character that, or enemy that we met where we saw such a gruesome murder. Him being able to look at Bell Mare in the face, knowing that she was protecting her kids and then being able to put a gun to her head and kill her was so much for me. And honestly, for me, it made One Piece that much more serious. One Piece still has its good nature energy, but we definitely took a little bit of a darker turn this arc, but still wrapped in our usual characters, sense of humor and personalities that kept it uplifting. But I wasn't expecting that kind of turn that we took here. We've done some, we've had some dark elements, but our enemy really doing something that brutal was different for me to see, even though our enemies do, you know, interesting things all the time. Arlong was a lot and his abilities, they're fishmen, so they can do great things underwater, on land, his teeth, his nose, everything about him was powerful. So with that, I have to say, he was a wonderful villain in the villain sense. He made our characters have to really fight. He was a true dominating force. I did enjoy that aspect of it, but he truly gave me the creeps. His character's design, all of it, his team was strong, everything about him. Nami has a sister, Nami has a sister and I love the way we were introduced to her and how casually she let it out when Usopp was at her house. And I really like her sister, I like her energy and she's like Nami. She may not want to go out necessarily and fight in the same manner that Nami does, but she does it when it's time. She shows up when it's time to show up and she's a lot more, I don't wanna say rational because I think Nami is pretty rational, but she's very level-headed and she is more of a protector even the way she protected the little boy at the beginning of the story who was upset and trying to fight Arlong's crew because they killed his dad. It was so sad. And how she would kind of oversee what was going on with Luby and his crew and say, hey, you guys should back off. Or if they needed her, she's like, let's go. Let's do what we have to do. I really liked that about her. And I felt like she was a nice 
peacemaker in this story with our main characters and just kind of navigating this story. I felt like she just had a great vibe and I adore her. And the part where she got a tattoo for Nami because Nami hated the tattoo she got when she had to join Arlong's crew. I loved it. She's just there. She's that big sister. She's that role model. She's that friend. She has a good heart and even though they're not blood sisters, they are 100% sisters and I love that for them. Belle Mare. Belle freaking Mare. What a tragically amazing character that woman was. I don't know. She's one of those characters where I can't shake it off. Like I can't shake off who she was, what she meant to the story, what she meant to Nami and her sister, and just what she meant as a representation as a person and standing up for what you believe in and what you love and who you love. When she just took the girls in, her immediate love for them, her immediate ability to be like, I'm going to raise them. I don't care if I don't have anything. First of all, she was on a ship where she was a going to die. Wasn't she a fighter of some sort? She was pretty good at what she did, but her ship was attacked or something. I'm probably saying that wrong. You can correct me below, but it was something like that. And the babies were on the board and the babies were Nami and Nojiko. I think that's how you pronounce Nami's sister's name. She just took them and she loved them right away and she raised them and she would sacrifice her own food so they could eat. It was pure love. Like she had a pure love for them. And that Arlong part, where Arlong comes and he is wanting everybody to provide 50,000 berries for each kid or 100,000 berries for each adult. And if they don't give it, he will kill them. Belmere did not have a lot of money and it wasn't written anywhere legally that the kids, Nami and her sister were Belmere's kids. So all she had to do was pay the 100,000 berries to Arlong and she would be fine. But Belle Mare felt differently. She could not not say that they were her children. When Belle Mare gave Arlong the 100,000 berries and then when he turned around, she said, those are for my kids, 50,000 for each. I just started bawling. I'm feeling emotional now. I started bawling because you knew she was about to die. She could not, she could not not say that they were her kids. Staying alive for her was not worth not being able to claim those two girls as her own children. I don't know how to feel about that. Would you do that? Is that the is that the right thing to do? Is that smart? I don't know how to feel. I don't know how to feel, but I also love it. I also love that she did that, but I can see myself not wanting to bow down to somebody so much that I can't even say that my kids are my kids. So I get it, I get it, but I also hate it. And Nami's tears and her sister's tears and just her getting shot in the town being like, what are you doing? It was so much. Regardless though, I love Belle Mayer. I love what she represented for the girls. I. She was a very interesting character and her story is going to sit with me for a bit. <laughs> I need to think about this and how I feel about it all for, for some days, but I absolutely loved her and what she brought to the story and to see why Nami became who she was. I just adore Zoro. I really adore his lack of fear. No, Zoro I think has fear. He's one of those people that fear doesn't scare him. Like when you look at Luffy, Luffy does not feel like he can lose. Like Luffy literally in his head is like, I, I just can't lose. I don't think Zoro feels that way, but Zoro is a representation of somebody that is stronger and smarter than whatever fears they have in their head and whatever holds them back. So his character carries a certain energy that none of the other characters have and his ability to just go into war. He has a mentality of a soldier. He does what he's supposed to do to accomplish his mission no matter what. And when he was fighting, when he was fighting in this arc with those wounds, do you know how how painful that, well, it's probably painful for him, but it was, I could feel it. I could feel the pain thinking of the wounds that he had from battling Mihawk previously in the other arc to now like having to take on all these literal fishmen with all these abilities and, and really still doing a good job. If Zoro could like not get injured at all, which I know is impossible, I think he could destroy most people. And I loved how he even kind of said that he's like nobody after the Mihawk thing, that really Really transformed him and he's like nobody's going to destroy me I'm going to fight Mihawk and you know inevitably become the the greatest swordsman I just always have such a sentimental attachment to Zoro I just think he's a wonderful character and he's designed so well he's a very subtle character but he has a mind of his own and he can sit back
back and let Luffy lead, but he's also a leader in and of itself. He's a silent leader and I absolutely adore him. Sanji was very much involved in this arc and I really like him a lot, but I do have to say his interest in women is fine. I don't care that he is this person who gets love struck at the sight of any woman that comes his way, but it doesn't fit his character to me. It just doesn't fit because he'll go from like smoking his cigarette and kicking people and like super chill about it. Then he's like a girl and loses like his sense of self. And it's very odd to me, but I still love Sanji. He's he's great. Um, I love his kicks. I loved when he went down in the water and had that battle. Oh, I could not breathe. Well, he probably couldn't breathe because he was under there for quite some time fighting, fighting that villain who could breathe underwater and who could fight underwater. And Sanji made it happen. He survived. He is such a beast. And then he went back under the water and broke the rock so Luffy could get out. I loved it. I loved it. But Sanji is very good under pressure and that's what I'm learning. And I think that's going to be excellent as time goes on. So I have to dedicate a certain part of this video to Luffy because Luffy in this arc showed me a side of him that has made him one of the best characters I have ever seen created. In this arc, I saw something in him that was so selfless. There is this moment, like it really, really touches me when Nami is about to just give up. She's about to give up because Arlong and his crew have deceived her. Her 100 million berries are gone. She doesn't see another way out. And all of a sudden we see her cry and she just looks over at Luffy and says, help. And he says the most simple word that means everything. And he tells her, okay. And he tells her with so much love and determination and care and fight that it is one of the most beautiful things that I've seen. It was, it was such a calm moment. It was such a calm moment when they were just going back and forth that he could see her slowly starting to break. And he was just letting her talk, letting her tell him to leave. And then when she finally finally asks for help, he doesn't hesitate. I, oh, it makes me so emotional. I've said that 2000 times, but it showed me that Luffy is just, he's an anomaly of a, of a human, of a character. He is, he's, he's special. Luffy is my favorite character, probably my favorite character of all time. I thought I was debating between this person and that person. No, it's Luffy. I also love the ending starting with when Luffy destroys Arlong and then he says Nami and she looks at him like, you know, in a quizzical manner and he's like, you're one of us now. And she's like, yeah. <laughs> So many great moments. Our long arc was great. I feel like there's probably still so much that I missed because there was so much meat to this arc, but just know I found it to be incredible. And I, I can't even process all my thoughts yet. I just finished it. So I need some more time to think. Maybe one day I'll do a live discussion on it because I could talk about this for hours. Like I said, I could talk about the Arlong arc forever, but I am going to get into the Logtown arc. Um, I don't have as much to say for one. It was only a couple of chapters. I think it was four chapters. And I felt weird about this arc. I don't know why. There were some like very high moments, but I think coming down from Arlong to this different kind of transitional period, we have a lot more of our old characters come back, which the first one I have to say is we see Shanks. Do you know how excited I got? And his introduction, just so cool. Mihawk and Shanks. Mihawk and Shanks. Luffy is now like the most wanted pirate. And Luffy's just kind of in his own world because in this arc, we go to this town called Logtown and that's where the original pirate king, Gold Roger was born and he also died there. So Luffy is excited <laughs> to go see where the pirate king had taken his last breath because Luffy wants to be the next pirate king. So he's really enamored about that. And while Luffy's doing that, Zoro is looking for new swords and he meets this girl and he has these weird feelings about this girl. He feels connected to her, not romantic feelings, but he feels like she looks like Kuina. I think I'm saying her name right. Kuina. That was the girl that we learned was kind of the reason that Zoro wants to be the greatest swordsman. Toshiga, in this um, log town looks like her. She looks a lot like her, so it shakes him up. So that's interesting. She is a part of the military, I believe. We also meet Lady Alvida again. I think that's how you pronounce her name, but she was like way back in the first couple of volumes. And she was also the one where we met Kobe, if my memory serves me correctly. And this woman looks completely different. She ended up eating the devil fruit, but I think hers was called the slip slip fruit. So I guess there's different kinds of gum gum fruit, no. 
there's different kinds of devil fruit that'll be interesting to learn about but it's like she's a different person and i guess she's working with buggy now i don't think they were working together before i don't think so but I'm happy to see him in this weird way. We also meet Captain Smoker of the Navy. I don't really know how to feel about him. I think I need more information. Did I, am I remembering this correctly? Did he eat the devil fruit too? Or am I making that up? But Buggy the Clown and Lady Alveda get trapped in a metal net and I can't remember who trapped them. This whole arc was a little confusing for me. I was trying to follow who was doing what. But then Captain Smoker sees Luffy and he says he's gonna get him and he won't let him leave or whatever. But then this man in a dark cape comes out and does like some kind of blast that stops Captain Smoker from getting Luffy. And his name is Dragon and he just comes out of nowhere, but he stops Captain Smoker from getting Luffy in the gang. I don't know if that's intentional or not, but Luffy and the crew get away and now they're headed to the Grand Line. So yeah, this was a little weird for me. It was really short, so nobody was fully developed. We don't know a lot of backstory on a lot of these people. We don't really know where Shanks is. We don't know much of anything, but we also learned a lot. So I'm guessing when I get into the next saga, we will learn more. But like I said, it was cool to see Shanks, cool to see some villains that we haven't seen in a while and just kind of getting prepared for what's to come and leaving the East Blue Saga. I'm excited to see what's what's in store as we enter the next saga. This video has come to an end but of course I will see you all in my next video. Until we meet again, go read.